Great. Now we'll hear uh, lots of ding dongs as everyone joins. <laughs> <Nice Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> ding dong. I say maybe we give it until two or three after, and then we'll officially start, give everybody a chance to get in. Yeah, we can give it a minute or so. And also we can start to give our introductory spiels as well in a minute. Good question. I know if the chat seems locked just to the panelists, did you want us to engage actually in the chat more actively? If you switch, if you switch it to um, being able to talk to the people who are joining, then we can be actively engaged and provide resources in the chat. Oh, got it. That's a great idea. Um, Sanjana owns this Zoom. Oh, she just said it should be open now. So you're all set. Thanks, Laura. Don't think it's open quite yet. I still have a default to everyone and then just the co-host. So maybe we need to fiddle with that a little bit. Hmm, okay, I'll, I'll explore that. Sorry about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm still learning something new about Zoom every day. I thought that I would by now actually know how to fully use the platform, but it's it's shocking how long it's taking me. It <laughs> um, I think we can go ahead and start just introducing everyone so that we get as long as we can for discussion. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to our panel and discussion on elder abuse hosted by the COVID-19 Task Force on Domestic Violence. This is the 12th in our seminar series. Uh, focused on educating and discussing domestic violence during this time. We are so thankful to have you tuned in and it would be great to get a sense of who is in the audience right now. So if you could all just introduce yourself in the chat box with your name, your preferred pronouns and where you're calling in from, that would be great. You can just throw that in the chat. And Tracy and I can introduce ourselves as well. My name is Kiara Alvanisi and I take the pronouns she, her, hers. I graduated from Harvard College with a degree in psychology and studies of women, gender, and sexuality. And I'm calling in today from our nation's capital in Washington, DC. And my name is Tracy Sake. I currently work as a field organizer for the Biden campaign. And I graduated from the Boston Conservatory, calling in from New York City. Great. And Tracy and I are part of the COVID-19 Task Force on Domestic Violence, as I said. The goals of the task force are threefold, an investigation of data on domestic violence, an education of the public on the issue and how to get involved, and adv advocacy on behalf of survivors. I, along with everyone on, am so glad you're here with us today. And if you wanna learn more about our organization, you can check the chat for a bit more information. Great, and I just um, threw in a little bit of info for you to follow up on after this, um, our website and our socials. Um, we are honored to be moderating this discussion with some incredible panelists who will be providing their expertise, insight, and reflections. We usually do longer introductions, but because our group is slightly larger today, we will just quickly introduce our panelists and then dive into our discussion. Today, we are joined by Jacqueline S. Gray, PhD. She is the Associate Director and Research Associate Professor at the Center for Rural Health, University of North Dakota. We have Bonnie Brandle, MSW, founder and director of the National Clearing House on Abuse in Later Life. Laura Tamblin Watts, LLB, president and CEO of Can Age. Bridget Penhale, reader emerita in mental health of older people at the University of East Anglia. We have Tony Rosen, MD, MPH researcher in elder abuse and geriatric injury prevention at Weill Cornell Medical College and a practicing emergency physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And Ali Alyssa Elman, wow. <laughs> Alyssa Elman, LMSW, lead social worker for the multidisciplinary vulnerable elder protection team at New York Presbyterian and Weill Cornell Medical Center. Great, thank you, Tracy. That is quite a mouthful. <laughs> As you can see, we have an it's an excellent and a stacked panel today. Uh, so without further ado, we'll start with a pretty basic question here, just for folks who might not know. Uh, to start very broadly, could you all just define elder abuse for us? Uh, 
Sure, it's Laura here. And first of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. I also just need to start by acknowledging that I am currently in the ancestral land of the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people here in Nova Scotia. Uh, when I'm thinking about elder abuse, we we use the terms sort of harm. I mean, I can give you definitions. There's lots of definitions. When we think about things in social movement theory, we're thinking about issues that expand and norm. But when fundamentally we get down to it, I think about harm done to an older person by somebody else or a system or an institution. And then when you get into the kind of deeper pieces of it, the question is whether or not that harm has to be um, on purpose or not at a fundamental level. And so we kind of delve into those ideas about whether or not we think that meaning to do it or not makes a difference. And another piece that we tease out when I'm talking to my students in particular is whether or not we require the idea of trust to be involved in that relationship. And I would offer that in Canada, we've actually taken the narrative of trust out because we feel that it actually um, is, there's an additional challenge for victims by saying, well, you, you were too trusting. You shouldn't have trusted that person. So it's a victim blaming. So when I think again about what is elder abuse, I think about harm to an older person that can include neglect and that harm is caused by a person or an institution. And then whether or not you wanna add the piece about trust or relationships, that's kind of an open book depending on your point of view. Excellent, thanks so much, Laura. And if anyone else has anything to add to that definition, we're definitely open to more responses as well. Um, this, well go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say with respect to the indigenous people that uh, we work with, the terms disrespect, more so than abuse, whenever we're talking with them, uh, tends to get more of that information. If you ask about abuse, it doesn't occur. And the other thing is around sexual abuse, talk about bothering. And that tends to address the issues much more within those communities. Yeah, this is Bonnie Brandle and I um, work at the intersection of domestic violence, sexual assault and elder abuse and I'm funded by the Office on Violence Against Women to really work specifically at this intersection. So uh, it, it's always, uh, when this question comes up, my answer is always, it depends. And I agree with everything that Laura and Jackie said. Um, it depends on who I'm talking to, which definition I'm using. So the World Health Organization has a great definition. The CDC does, DOJ and HHS uh, have a definition out of their roadmap map. Um, when I'm working with local folks, we look at their state statutes, some of which may have good definitions and some of which may have been in, written in the 1980s and could use some work um, getting up to our more current standard. But when we're also looking at the work uh, funded by the Office on Violence Against Women, uh, their abuse in later life program uh, looks at the four crimes. So domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking and dating violence, and then adds in financial exploitation and neglect as as, as how they take a look at the term that we use instead, which is abuse in later life to be a little bit more encompassing of the four crimes. Got it, and Bonnie, you just mentioned this pretty explicitly, but often elder abuse is, is categorized under a form of domestic violence. I'm curious, uh, seeing as this panel focuses on domestic violence broadly, what you all think is unique about elder abuse within the category of domestic violence? I think one of the things with uh, the indigenous people that we work with, they've really emphasized spiritual abuse, which is not among those that are legally charged, but that they feel like has as deep or deeper impact than some of the others. If, if I could just come in here from a, a slightly different perspective from the U UK, um, one of the things that I think is not necessarily totally unique, but but is needs to be included in the mix is financial situations. So if we're talking about intimate partner violence by a, a partner or former partner, then quite often there, there may be very high levels of financial abuse, financial dependency. 
um, in a way that's not always seen with younger women, although of course it can be. And I think the other thing that I'd like to sort of add in here is neglect, because I think we need to recognize that situations can include quite high levels of neglect, particularly if somebody has some need for, for support or for, for some system of care. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with that. And I would also it's sort of what do you mean by domestic violence? So some people will, yes, Bridget did nicely there really talk about it just as intimate partner violence. But we know in the states, many of our state laws include other family relationships when they're talking about domestic violence. So one of the things when I use that broader definition of domestic violence, that's really different is what does it feel like to a mom or a dad who's being abused by an adult child or a grandparent who's being abused and that's a really unique and complex and important relationship for us to be recognizing. Um, I also think one of the other differences it, that we see is that um, while many of the older adults that we work with have full capacity and are very actively uh, involved in community, a fair number of them also have some physical limitations. Patients, uh, dementia or other cognitive uh, disabilities. And we really need to think about services in a creative way to address the needs of those folks. Sure, thank you for sharing. I also wanna point out that I've um, thrown all of the panelists' bios in the chat. So that is why there is so much information in there because they all have such wonderful um, lengthy bios to share with us. Um, and on to the next question. Um, what do you feel is a unique challenge in preventing and responding to elder abuse? I think similar to what uh, Bonnie just said is um, working with individuals who may have cognitive impairment is a really unique challenge of this work. Um, making sure that those, you know, maybe more vulnerable individuals are still safe and on the um, other ends of the spectrum. There's lots and lots of older adults who do have capacity, but similar to domestic violence may refuse intervention, may not be ready to accept um, services. And so being able to meet the person where they're at and you know, trying to facilitate a safe plan with them while respecting their rights to make their own decisions if they're able to. I, th I think one of the other areas which is is a little bit different than, than some of the other situations we see with domestic violence affecting younger people is the length of time that if we're thinking about relationships even within the family the length of time that relationships have existed and the fact that you know you may be talking about decades worth of, of problems that have have been established for a very long time and therefore trying to find resolution to those those difficulties is is not necessarily simple straightforward or easy to do i couldn't agree more and i would say uh this is tony that from my perspective another unique thing about elder abuse is that older adults can change and older adults can have increasing functional impairments and increasing cognitive needs and uh, the nature of mistreatment uh, can change as those things change. And that's an important thing for us all to keep in mind uh, as we work to prevent and intervene. Yeah, um, mine is actually much more uh, rude. Um, we're considered a, a polite country. I would say it's because people don't care about old people. Um, I think that fundamentally people care about younger I'm going to use terms here, younger women in particular. I think there's a lot of issues in our uh, non-binary gender and transgender. So I'm going to use the very term cis women who are in domestic violence who are younger, particularly in a heterosexual, like it's a very narrow slice about what we, I will speak only for my country, what we seem to care about in Canada. And I have spent decades now trying to, um, help support the thinking in the domestic violence movement that women don't just become you know old and then lose their gender and lose their identity and lose their purpose and lose their feelings and relationships at a certain magical age and then they become these sort of blobs so i can raise money all day long for younger women 
in the field of domestic violence, no problem. People really care about that in Canada. But trying to raise money for elder abuse or trying to work in the domestic violence movement, trying to support people challenging their thoughts about how we're responding to abuse and neglect uh, at an older adult situation, even if it's domestic violence grown old, it may be a person who was in a relationship for 50 years and it was domestically violent when they were 19 and is equally domestically violent at 91. But I would offer that the unique challenge associated with it is that we have these layers of ageism, which are in my respectful view, quite prevalent in our uh, women's movement and our domestic violence movement. It's an uncomfortable thing to say about an area that I've been involved in, but I'm, I'm gonna say it. People don't care about old people. And, um, and I'm really hoping that we can help to change that. So the conversations like this are important. If I could just add, uh, carry on Jackie, because I've already said something. Oh, I was just gonna say with regard to natives, it's counter to the culture to disrespect elders. They're, they're to be honored and revered and respected. But, you know, we're seeing that change with the, the prevalence of the Western culture uh, influencing a lot of things that happen. The, the other piece, they really don't, uh, don't want to go through the legal system because of the relationship with the government in the past. And so trying to find uh, approaches that are more restorative justice, that are there to repair the relationship are more accepted and uh, we're able to intervene more than those coming from the justice system. Bridget, I know you were going to say something, if you'd still like to say something. <laughs> well, but very quickly, I suppose, picking up on what, what Laura was saying about the, the sort of distinction between what ha what's happening to younger people, um, perhaps in particular younger women, but also what's happening later on, is that what we found here is that there's quite a distinction. So domestic violence services, as we know them in the UK, don't always look at, at what the needs for older people are in or in particular older women but then our sort of social support services um, which would include our equivalent to our adult protective services which we would call safeguarding adults actually are not looking at, at so much at relationship stuff they're looking at it in terms of needs for care they need and what support is is necessary and they're not looking at the sort of dimensions of what what's actually going on in the relationships and the dynamics and that that creates some difficulty because it's sort of neither side is actually looking at, at the whole picture. I would agree. I think that's a really important part of understanding challenges in elder abuse intervention and prevention is that uh, just as Bonnie said quite eloquently, we exist or our field exists at the intersection of domestic violence and caregiving and, and issues in, in later life. And, and sometimes uh, the existing service services aren't really well focused on the older adult survivors that we really wanna make sure we're caring for. I wondered if I could pick up on uh, Tony's point about mild cognitive impairment or other cognitive changes. One of the things that Bridget and, and Bonnie and I often talk about is trying to figure out, is this something that's happening because of an organic health issue? Or is this a pattern of abuse? Is this something because of change in life or lifestyle? Or is there actually a behavioral response because of some type of cognitive impairment like an Alzheimer's related dementia. So let me put that in a kind of a context you have and I'm gonna be super gendered about this. You have a husband and wife, they've been together for 60 years. They've had a good relationship. They've never had a problem in particular in their relationship of any notes with regards to violence or oppression. And then all of a sudden he starts hurting her. He starts hitting her, getting angry, lashing out. Is it because he has had a financial reversal? Is it because he's having challenges with his mental health? Is it because he's now just retired and having a hard time with late age and stage? 
Or is this actually a behavioral fear-based response because of an organic medical condition? And so sometimes we have to be a bit more nuanced. I mean, Tony, I would like to maybe toss it back over to you for that, because that's an area that you spend a lot of time thinking about. I think that, you know, again, uh, it reminds me of something that I heard um, a few years ago at an elder abuse conference that I think many of us were at. Uh, when a colleague and friend, Sid Stahl, said elder abuse, it's not rocket science, it's way harder. And I think that at the end of the day, there are some real challenges in unpacking the really complicated interpersonal issues. Um, and all, just as you said, there are challenges in brain function, in understanding relationships, in changing relationships, um, all of which make understanding what's going on in a relationship challenging and understanding what an appropriate intervention, if any, might be challenging as well. Yeah, and I, Laura, I love that example that you gave, and I appreciate everything that you just added, Tony, and it's why I think it's so great when an ER doc like you can work with a social worker like me, because we bring different perspectives, right? I bring that advocate and that MSW perspective, because Laura, I would add another um, layer to what you just said. It may be about him, but really, if we sit down and ask her what's going on, she, there may never have been physical violence before but maybe she's always been he's always had her on an allowance maybe she's only been able to talk to her sister for seven minutes a month on the phone and so as we start to unpack with her what's going on I as an advocate would totally name that as a power and control dynamic that's been happening forever just never acknowledged and missed over the so many years because I think another thing that makes domestic violence and sexual assault in later life particularly unique is think about when this might have started for those relationships that Bridget mentioned, those 40, 50, 60 year relationships, there were no words for domestic violence. Uh, there was no word for rape. Things were, uh, it was completely legal for husbands to sexually assault their wives. Uh, there were no domestic violence programs. So we sometimes ask that question of victims, why does she stay? Well, many of these victims that were in these relationships 40, 50, 60 years ago actually did try to leave and had a very inappropriate response from healthcare providers and law enforcement and others and may not be aware that the world has changed and there that there are more options for them. So um, yes, to everyone's point, the complexity of, of, of this particular issue is one why I am so glad that you're coming together this morning and having this conversation. This is excellent. Thank you all so much for, for the dynamic conversation so far. Um, I guess we're really here just to, to put us in the context of why this panel, this specific panel is occurring. We are here because this task force was created and founded to address the issue of specifically domestic violence during COVID-19, um, which is something we're all over the globe at the moment. So I know that's a very different lived experience for, for all of us and probably for all of the work you do. It's quite different given the pandemic, but um, that is I'm sure a unique challenge to a degree that we're all facing. I'm curious to hear more about what your work has been like, if you've seen any differences in, in the elder abuse situation or in how you're working to, to stop the elder abuse uh, given the pandemic. Can I jump in there just to give you a sense? So our federal government actually cares a lot about domestic violence. That's one thing that's it's really nice to be able to say. They just added another $100 million to COVID domestic violence response last week, in addition to their $157.5 million that they announced earlier in the summer. So we've had about $250 million invested federally since COVID-19 and domestic response. Do you know how much they've invested in elder abuse? Not a dime. And, and what I can say is there's lots of investments and responses for older people. So they invested about $350 million in response to support older people, but that intersectionality that was really, really missed. So that's interesting around that. What I want to share as well is that we are seeing in Ontario, I've done a bit of data and a bit of research in Ontario, which I'm choosing because it's one of the two um, most integrated elder abuse response networks in Canada. So I'm just choosing that one uh, if it's helpful. Within, you know, within a couple of weeks, they were getting 
about a tenfold increase of calls. The number of calls that it would get typically might have been about 800 calls a month. They were getting 800 calls every three days. But for the statisticians in the group, that was with an 85% call drop rate. So of the 15% of calls that would go through, it was 800 every three days. That was the start. Then we looked at what was happening in terms of reporting. Now, criminal reports in Canada are less likely. We don't tend to come at it with a criminal justice framework. We tend to come at it through a social services framework for good or for bad. That's kind of the way we do it. Um, elder abuse criminal aspects dropped by about 90%. So there were people reaching out to quiet resources who no longer felt that they could call the police. And to me, that paints a very evocative picture. Okay, just to follow up on that, <clears throat> how have you seen efforts surrounding elder abuse change during COVID-19, if at all? And I know Laura just touched on that a little bit, but if anybody else wants to jump in on that, if they've noticed any change during the pandemic. Well, from the perspective of New York City, uh, obviously we were uh, one of the early United States epicenters uh, of the pandemic. And what we saw during the lockdown period, and, I, and many places have had lockdown periods, is that at least initially, it was harder for service providers to respond. Uh, senior centers were closed. Uh, Meals on Wheels had more difficulty providing services. Adult Protective Services had more challenges responding in person. And so um, the first difficulty was that older adults were even more isolated. Uh, older adults that required care from home health aides or other agencies, those providers sometimes weren't able, uh, were sick or were uncomfortable uh, going to provide care to older adults, making family caregivers, informal family caregivers have even larger responsibilities for care. Um, folks and, and uh, friends and colleagues of ours have worked on on research looking at concerned others. Many older adults are protected uh, informally by folks in the community, neighbors that are sort of watching over them and providing not only surveillance, but check-ins. And it was harder for those folks during the lockdown period to provide support. Um, and so the degree of isolation was, was dramatic, I think, for many older adults during, during a lockdown period and the resources uh, that are designed to respond had to change. Um, people had to start to focus more on telephone and telehealth and video assessments, both formally and informally. And people had to recognize that some of the things that they were doing in the past had to be changed. And so one of the things that I think many of us are very interested in, particularly during the lockdown period, but also during the, the extended period of change in everyone's life that's extended beyond is how these service providers have innovated, how they changed. Because obviously many service providers had issues in their own ranks uh, with the disease and so on and so forth. And so there have been a lot, lot of challenges. Um, and hopefully we've, we're all learning what kind of innovative solutions folks have come up with? I, th I think from our perspective in the UK, we've also seen a lot of attention, you know, a, a, similar to Tony's point about, you know, challenges. There were challenges in the bucket load or by the bucket load in relation to institutional forms of care and what was happening to older individuals in those, those care homes, in the nursing homes. And a lot of attention was being paid to what was happening for those individuals, more than individuals living out in the community, you know, either with perhaps with partners or with family members. And so, you know, there were difficulties in relation to how to find out what was happening in those care homes which had locked down. Um, but equally, 
huge difficulties in trying to find out what's, what exactly has been happening to individuals living in the community. And one of the things that was very noticeable was that in, initially calls into our adult safeguarding, safeguarding adult services declined dramatically, calls of all sorts about all adults who might be at risk of harm. Um, and then they started to increase, but it, that was in relation to institutional care rather than to what was happening in the community. Now there's, there's been some steps to, to the fact that, you know, reports are coming in, but then what's, ha what's happened of, of course as well is, is difficulties in trying to, to ascertain what's happening if you're not going to be doing a, a home in-person visit. Um, and what the risks to individuals might be if you're doing things over the phone when you can't tell what's happening at the other end. I know for a lot of the tribes that we work with, the, the access, you know, they may not have uh, a cell link. They not, may not have any wireless service or internet or anything like that. Um, they're out in rural areas. Uh, we had some of our, um, our senior programs in, in delivering food boxes to the elderly uh, put in uh, a big red piece of paper and a big green piece of paper. And if they were okay, they'd put the green piece of paper up in their window. And if they needed help for some reason, they'd put the red one up. And that way they, the paper could be seen from the road, someone driving by in order to provide help. But, you know, trying to find things like that because they're very socially isolated. Um, we've had some of our elders request that we provide addresses for the uh, adult protective services so that they could mail in a complaint as opposed to trying to call when maybe the abuser was right there beside them that they felt more comfortable with that. So trying to be creative and innovative in finding ways to keep those very isolated rural areas connected. Yeah, I would agree with everything people have said. And then to just go a little bit to a macro level, in addition to everything that they just said, um, I June 15th is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day every year. And I remember this year sitting on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and being more discouraged than I've ever been in my career for two reasons. There are two things that I think we were really making strides with in the elder abuse field. Um, we know that social isolation uh, is really a significant problem and to the Agree that we can use social support as a way to prevent elder abuse. We, I thought we were making strides with that. And COVID really took that away, as you're hearing from everybody else here. Um, and then the ages, and this is going back to what Laura said, but, but I literally on all of your questions, I believe wrote ageism down as one of the answers that I wanted to talk about. Because the number of ageist messages that were out there as a result of COVID, the people carrying signs saying we want to get back to work, let the weak die. Um, the politicians and other leaders uh, around our country that were putting out those kinds of similar messages that it's more about the economy and we really don't care about old people at all. To have a mom who's an older adult who's uh, hearing those messages coming across her TV screen and to know what we know about when the, when older adults hear those messages and the impact on their health in general, and then at a time when they're at risk for a virus, really very heartbreaking. And I feel like we're going to have a lot of work that we're going to have to do to come back, not only in terms of service delivery, but in terms of these societal messages um, and figuring out how to be creative with making sure that social support um, is happening. And Jack, you gave some great examples of how creative uh, service providers are being right now to address those two issues. Yeah, okay, so Bonnie and I've been talking through this whole thing about once a week at a minimum, and I have to say it is a different narrative in Canada. So, I mean, I do between five and 25 major national interviews a day on average during COVID-19, because the main news story is seniors. And it is a very empathetic and very concerned narrative, particularly around social isolation and particularly around uh, COVID and long-term care. And we had a very different, and when we were having a conversation, you said like that, that wasn't a conversation that you were having at, a, at an American level. And it was very different. So what I would say for the Canadian discourse was extremely concerned with older people and tons of community together. We tend to be a bit more compliant, I think, as a, as a country by our natures, perhaps. 
But even with that very nice and caring and concerned and front and center narrative, it wasn't getting into the abuse dynamics. It was about COVID. And where we could not get farther was, yes, it's unfortunate people are isolated or yes, it's unfortunate that you know it's in long-term care home. But we couldn't get to the, yeah, and I'm locked up with my abuser or yeah, my son who has been abusing me or now has started because he's lost his job and has moved home and actually brought a whole family. And now I'm subject, but also I'm paying for them and I'm housing them. And now I have layers of abuse because I am isolated from other folks. I have perhaps an abusive relationship and a spousal relationship. I now maybe have another form of abusive relationship and or dependencies and I am the person who can't get away. And so that narrative for all that, all that like seniors are the front page news for five months nowhere was that discussion happening. So there is this reticence to talking about it, even when you have the front page news at your ready. This is just a quick question, Laura, going off script slightly for, for you. I find it really fascinating that there's such an attention to that in Canada. And I haven't read, I don't think a single thing about it in the United States where I'm kind of calling you from. I'm curious if you have any thoughts, Laura, if anyone else does on, on why that might be. Like, why do you think Canada's um, government or, or people are more attentive to this issue while, while we're failing to attend to it in the United States? One should never speak about another country. I will offer this. <laughs> um, our, I think, you know, we have more of a social structure in Canada in terms of social safety nets. So there's an importance. If you ask Canadians what they thought was most important about Canada after they said hockey, Mm -hmm. they would tell you that their social safety net was the most important thing. So there is a piece of that. It's a different social narrative. The other piece is, I mean, I think that the leadership from the Canadian government and American government has been quite different in terms of public health response. And we're, um, we're challenged to um, see how the American response has been in comparison to some other maybe more socialized countries. I think leadership plays an important role in that. And, and Laura, you, you know us well, and Bridget, you, you know us well too. So would you also agree that um, when you look at the United States, we've got a really, I think, robust and wonderful response to child abuse and to domestic violence and sexual assault violence against women issues. But I don't feel like we've done the, the level of collaboration that I feel like I've heard from you, Laura, in Canada, where you guys are really working, your, your leaders in the elder justice space are able to work together and put a very forward forward message uh, and, and spending the amount of time on the media that you're spending where those of us in the states I feel like are working really hard on some things but 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 it but it's hard when we're so under resourced at this point yeah we would say the same thing kind of in a slightly different way I mean like anything else you all know each other and you're working really hard in that area what I would offer is in the Canadian context there has been a very much all shovels in approach to COVID-19 fairly compliant country in terms of restriction doesn't mean that we don't have some anti-maskers and what we have you know we've got our fringy stuff too don't kid yourself we're not we're not all perfect for, but I would say generally they're more um, willing to follow kind of medical direction. And I think maybe the messages are a little bit crisper in terms of what the impact is. In, in terms, because I think that seniors has been the focus of COVID in Canada, now it's back to school, but we're getting back to seniors, has been really a, the story of COVID-19. Uh, we have been able to raise much more awareness and a huge amount of empathy associated. Uh, but I'm hoping what that translates into is kind of a horizontal intersection around our issues in other areas, right? We talk about intersectionality, but sometimes ageism blocks that intersectionality. And so I'm really hoping that one of the positive things that comes out of it is that you can actually shine a light into those issues and the outrage and scare and horror will allow us to take that one step further and actually talk about the intersection of domestic violence, which 
could be intimate partner or lifelong or other forms of family you know, violence of an older person, which is a piece that we still don't want to talk about. That's that is our challenge, and and funding is restricted as well. And I guess I'd just like to add in that you know, it's it's further complicated in a little tiny island where you have people who are so incompetent that they change the message and. People are very confused. You know, we're not as compliant as is evident from what has happened in even within government or those advising government, you know, doing what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it, thinking that the rules didn't apply to them. And, and so what we've seen now is that, that the public are confused. They're making up their own minds. They, they don't trust the government. Um, the focus that there was on age, and, and there was quite a focus on age, not nothing like as as much as in Canada, but there was a focus on age. That's sort of been dissipated because people are just saying, you know, this group of people who are supposed to be in charge have no clue what's going on here. Um, and, you know, we, we're we not in a position where we're looking over the ac across the pond all the time, but I think we're, we're sort of sitting betwixt and between and thinking, well, where are we headed now? So, you know, we're just, we're not sure about direction. It just looks like there's a, you know, there's another disaster looming because, you know, they have plenty of time to plan for the second wave as they had time to plan for the first wave. And we still doing things too little too late. And, you know, they're going to be changing their minds for, for quite a while to come. And, and people are making up their own minds, what they what they feel comfortable with and what they're safe with. Um, which means that some people are choosing to be isolated for much longer periods because they really just don't think that, you know, it's, it's safe to be exposing yourself to who knows what. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, how do you see the future of elder abuse advocacy looking and how would you like it to look? I think um, I'm hopeful at least that um, maybe COVID's increased the profile of this issue and maybe, um, I have Siri popping up on my laptop, sorry. Um, and that hopefully we can get a little bit um, more traction and domestic violence is, um, you know, under-resourced and elder abuse is that much more under-resourced. And so hopefully, um, you know, both of these fields that are very much connected can um, get a bit more traction and, and hopefully um, we could put more resources towards community agencies that can help with intervention. Um, I'll just share that right now we released um, a, a roadmap and I put it in the chat here at CanAge called Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada. So it is a nonpartisan roadmap, really summarizing all of the key issues that Canada needs to do to make things forward. It's got six compass points and the V in voices stands for violence and abuse prevention. Across their six compass points, there's 40 issues. And then there's about 135 recommendations. So it is really an action plan and a roadmap for our country moving forward. It won't surprise you to know we start at violence and abuse prevention. I think that Canada is going to have to engage in a more fulsome set of responses. And so I know that you know we can cherry pick from our best um, international responses. And I think that Canada is going to have to take a bit more of a focused point of view for elder abuse response. I think that it can be very good or very poor. And that type of lack of clarity about what kind of response you're going to get is really one of our key challenges. What I can see is that, you know, even in my students, when I teach at U of T, my classes are doubling and tripling. I and mean, we've just been asked to do an undergrad class in, in these areas. Those are encouraging as it means that more people care. Um, and I would offer that I think I think there may be a watershed moment. I am an eternal optimist. You can't work in social justice without being an optimist. I'm an eternal optimist. And I do feel like there's a sense that the elder rights movement is now being accepted as kind of the next social movement after the green movement, disability movement, uh, gender movement, and, and so on. And, 
And so it seems like there is this pivot point, this moment in time for our younger generations that actually are starting to think about it in a social justice framework, which I find very encouraging. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, that switches everything, but I do think if we can lodge it within that social justice narrative as a movement, we can get more traction. Yeah, Laura, like you, I'm an eternal optimist. You have to be to last as long as I have in this field. And I, well, it's devastating what what, what the the deaths and the uh, the destroy the, all of the things that have happened in terms of elder abuse and and COVID. There are things I think that are happening that that give me some hope. And the reality in America is that as about 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day um, for the next what 12, 13, 14 years, this issue is going to come to the forefront because. It it, the, the numbers will simply be there. But I think that the um, uh, negative ageist images that are out there give us an opportunity to, to confront those and challenge those in a way that it's harder to do when it's more insidious. Uh, we can, uh, we have some really practical examples. And I have seen since March on the national level and international level, because as Laura said, Laura Bridget, um, Jane Mears from Australia, and I talk every other week uh, about what what's going on internationally. And I meet with the group weekly to talk about what's happening on the national level. I think there's more collaboration uh, at this point and more conversations among people. And, and then my final thing that just gives me a lot of hope is when I talk to people on the local level, um, because our project is funded to work with grantee communities across the country. Some of the most creative stuff that was happening was starting in the elder space. Uh, so I know a domestic violence program that the first support group that got started virtually was their older woman's support group. And in Denver, the fir first court case that went to, to actually physically be in the court was an elder abuse case. And so because we're used to working with not a lot of resources and having to be creative and quick on our feet, we've been sometimes the first group to step forward. Um, and we've been part of sending out information to faith leaders across the country to because they're connecting with older adults and have seen a great response to the faith community stepping into the space in a new way. So I, I, I think it's a hard time, but there's just a lot of opportunity and a lot of incredible things that people are, are doing um, in the midst of what's going on. This is Tony. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm also an optimist, uh, as we all are, and I'm a health, I'm a health person. And so I do feel like um, we are seeing movement towards focusing on older adults in the healthcare system as well. Um, there are movements towards age-friendly hospitals and age-friendly healthcare systems. I'm an emergency department physician, and we're focusing more on geriatric emergency medicine and on specific types of care uh, and specific ne care needs for older adults in the acute care setting and how we can redesign our emergency departments. Uh, to be more uh, age friendly and, uh, and to take into account the specific issues that older adults have, which frankly include uh, a more comprehensive assessment for elder mistreatment and uh, potential interventions and prevention efforts. And I guess I'd like to sort of pick up on what, what Laura was saying in terms of the social justice element and, and the sort of rights perspective, because internationally there's been a discussion over the past decade around whether there should be a new convention on the rights of older people, because it's one piece of the, the rights system which is notably absent. Of course, older people are covered by the Universal Declaration, but there are some specific aspects that need taking into account. And what we've seen, you know, we had we had um, statements from the Secretary General of the UN, which actually raised the issue of violence and abuse as one of the key areas during the pandemic that would need to be dealt with in relation to older people. So I think, you know, we're seeing some gentle movement forward, I think, you know, being an optimist as everybody else. Um, I'm not going to say I'm the pessimist in in the crowd, but um, it, it's encouraging to see the, that sort of move and more countries being sort of open to discussion about how to deal with situations of elder abuse and what to do about the violence that older people are, are experiencing all the time. And we work with, I think it's 
575 federally recognized tribes now. And only about 100 of them have an elder abuse code. So, you know, this all is so new as far as trying to work in tribal areas. We've been funded uh, less than 10 years. And there's such a big gap in what needs to be done and having culturally appropriate resources and trainings and things like that. And it's, it's really exciting to see in some of the tribal communities, some young and innovative uh, people working in the field and the things that they're doing and how they're able to reach out and the types of ideas they have and things like that that are really making a difference in those communities and they're becoming models for other tribes to be able to, to begin some of those things. Excellent, great, thank you so much. It's inspiring to hear about your, your visions for the future and I hope um, we just continue to, to make progress here. In the last few minutes or so, uh, I would love to turn to one of the purposes of, of having these discussions, which is figuring out how to involve folks from all different spaces, even people who aren't working in elder abuse, uh, to help prevent and respond to instances of elder abuse. So I'm curious, what are some ways that you all think communities and individuals can work always, but especially during the pandemic, to prevent the proliferation of elder abuse? Yeah, check in. You know, so much of this is about relationships, right? fundamentally. I mean, we can talk about it at a global, we can talk about it at a national point of view, but fundamentally check in, see how someone's doing. It's our Thanksgiving weekend. And, you know, I knocked on doors in my local community and wanted to see how folks are doing and invited a bunch of them to Thanksgiving dinner. And then when you have that opportunity, try to make sure that you have a chance to talk. And I'm going to be gendered here talk to older women and see how they are. Don't fill in the spaces, ask open-ended questions, ask maybe how things may have changed for them in times of COVID-19, wait for an answer. Don't talk over people, particularly younger people will often want to fill in the words because they may feel a little bit hesitant and you get that excitement going. Big, warm, open-ended questions, a sense of contact, just a, like a pop by with your dog and wave. It sounds small. The impacts are big. Yeah, I completely agree. I think checking in on your neighbors or people in your community, something that small can make a huge difference and recognizing that elder abuse is more common than we think and even more common right now. Um, so I think that check-in can do a lot. I think actually, in addition to checking in, there's something around getting conversations going within communities. So it's about raising awareness at that at sort of local level about this, about situations, about the fact that, you know, we know that abuse affects a lot of people and it affects older people as, you know, as well as younger people and things can happen that, that can switch a relationship or, you know, what to do if you're concerned the, the sort of gentle discussion, which is raising awareness, but it's also letting people know that, you know, things can be done to, to alter situations for individuals. We have a poster on uh, ways, <clears throat> excuse me, ways to love your elders. And it has like over a hundred different types of small things that you can do to show love to your elders. And we had one of our, um, tribal programs contact us and ask if we could reformat that from a poster into like a billboard. And they uh, took that and put it up on a billboard. They said between the, the casino and the bar. So people were seeing it all the time when they passed it going to one or the other. So those types of things, getting out, you know, little things that people can do, as, as Laura was saying, to show that love to any elder, it doesn't just have to be a relative. 
Yeah, I love all those ideas and agree, agree with all of that. In, in my personal life, all of my friends, uh, and, and including me, know people within our own families or close to us who are victims of elder abuse or are being treated poorly by, by somebody. So um, all of what they said is a great idea. I would go back to that macro level about thinking about ageism. It's so insidious sometimes, but it is everywhere if you start to look at it and start to call it out and challenge it. Um, in the when you see it in very direct things in the media, we need more people in the media coming back and challenging those things. And, and all of you, I think, use social media probably way more effectively than I do since I use it zero. Um, I, I, but but it, it is a great space to be able to do that. But as you're also just in, um, if you're doing work at a domestic violence program, are all the images on the poster of younger moms uh, and kids? Uh, is the material, when people go out and do presentations on domestic violence, are you only talking to younger people or are you going to senior centers and facilities and places where older people are going to gather really thinking strategically about how we can lift up uh, the needs of older adults and and reach out to them because many of them will say uh, and have said to me I would have told someone if anybody would have asked but no one ever asked um, and so or I would I would I know there's a domestic violence program in my community it's great and I'll tell my granddaughter about it if she needs it, but does they don't think about it as services for themselves. So how can we work on our messaging to change change that perception? And we talk about with programs when we're doing trainings, you know, making this a part of the conversation, not having it be that that topic you don't really talk about or you just talk about in private, but bring it up as a part of regular conversation so that it makes it easier for people to bring up things that are happening. Got it. And Laura, I just saw your comment in the chat about bringing it up always in conversations with policymakers, funders, media, et cetera. And I know we're all coming from different places, different states, countries again, but if there are any specific like bills or legislation or, or folks who are working in this space, elected officials, um, it would be great also to hear about those so we know specific initiatives and, and such to support. Well, I'll let my American colleagues, because probably your audience wants to know about more American pieces, but I will say that Canada is starting to work together on a national strategy for elder abuse, which actually has an operational and tactical level. So it's not just sort of a high level, which is important too, but actual tactical things. Uh, one of the things that I would just offer kind of in a, in a can-do, bring it up always, See if you've got some great tip sheets in your jurisdictions. I've got some in mind, and I know my colleagues do as well, about how to make sure that services are age inclusive. And I'm using the term age inclusive rather than age friendly on purpose, because if you are running, say, a domestic violence shelter, but you haven't had a chance to look around and think those stairs are going to be a problem, or how do I get supportive services in? Or maybe I need a second banister, I'll be okay, but if I have two banisters, or maybe the lockout hours in homeless shelters are going to be deeply problematic if you're a, a homeless person who's an older person, right? So to help be able to make things more age inclusive for quote regular services. So I think about working horizontally across all service delivery and making them more age inclusive while at the same time being really forward in our vertical on elder abuse and that intersection with domestic violence. Bonnie, you're working a lot at the legislative level and you've worked, I, I don't know if there's particular issues that you wanna bring up that would speak to your American colleagues. Yeah, so in the Violence Against Women Act, which is not, it needs to be reauthorized, there is a small program um, on abuse in later life. Uh, historically, it has received the smallest amount of money of any of the programs um, under the Violence Against Women Act. So uh, a place, if, if you're doing work to promote the Violence Against Women Act, really paying attention to and making sure that that program doesn't get dropped because it's so small. And ideally, again, because our numbers of older adults are increasing, more money um, would be helpful for that program. Program. And then there's an elder justice coalition that folks can join um, that uh, addresses, like Jackie mentioned in the chat, the Older Americans Act, uh, the Elder Justice Act, uh, many of these uh, things that have not been reauthorized in a while and maybe could address other parts of elder justice work in, in new and creative uh, ways if we were able to put more language in. And so if you're wanting to track stuff, I would suggest uh, Elder Justice uh, Coalition and following, obviously, the National Task Force on Domestic Violence looking at all of FALA. 
And I guess just to, to come in again and, and say, you know, look at what's happening in the open ended working group on aging at the UN, because that's the, the place where the, the stuff around the UN, the, the possibility of a new convention is happening. And so actually sort of seeing if there's some, some way to input in that. And, you know, one of the things that has been apparent is that America is extremely reluctant um, and has been for, for quite a long time for all sorts of different reasons to, you know, to accept that there, there could be a need. Um, we're seeing some movement in other countries, but actually, you know, I, in all the, the places that you might be able to influence and all the discussions that you have actually talk to people about the fact that there could be a convention on the rights of older people and it could make a difference to older people's lives in particular around violence, abuse and neglect. Um, and therefore, you know, the fact that there are countries that are equivocal at best about whether or not there's a need, um, you know, has to have some way of addressing it. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're at the hour mark, which is wild to me. I can't believe that much time has passed. So we just want to thank you all so much again for taking the time. It's very cool to find out this is about half the experts that exist in this space. It's a, it's a huge honor to have you all on with us. Um, so thank you all again. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving to our folks calling in from Canada. Um, and we're going to post some information in the chat for folks who want to follow us on social media, etc. But otherwise, have an excellent weekend, everybody. And thank you so much again to our panelists. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.